Uh, I encourage you to uh, reference previous webinars um, that are a part of this Sharing Success campaign. Uh, you'll find that uh, your colleagues in the network are sharing uh, lots of uh, positive and useful information. Uh, again, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Prentice Davis with the National Network, and uh, we're going to spend time uh, hearing from experienced directors about how they promote uh, strong persistence. The outcome for this call is that Gateway to College directors will share strategies, practices, and tools to increase or maximize the percentages of students who persist uh, from semester to semester. So uh, the directors that we have with us today, um, our panelists are Deb Beepo from Mount Wachusett Community College. And uh, Mount Wachusett has been open since 2006, and they've served over 470 students. Uh, next is Janelle Soto-Quintana, director of the Pueblo program, uh, Pueblo, Colorado. They opened in 2009. And they have served over uh, 600 students. And then last but not least, we have Vivian Ostrowski. She's the director at Mount Wachusett Community College. They opened in 2008. And they're serving a lot of students um, and have, have served uh, well over uh, 200 students plus. And uh, they have lots of good information to share with you uh, this morning. So uh, this is uh, the slide that you're looking at right now is a slide that um, highlights uh, what has happened with regard to fall to fall persistence at uh, the programs represented on the call this morning. And when we talk about uh, persistence, uh, just for the general understanding, we are essentially talking about the number of students who start at the beginning of a semester, and then uh, the percentage of those students who return for the following semester. Um, and for the most part, uh, we're going to narrow this down to fall to fall persistence uh, specifically. Uh, there are other persistent measures, uh, term to term persistence. Um, fall to fall persistence is a, a number that um, community colleges track as well. So. Uh, be an interesting comparison to look at uh, your site's own numbers. But uh, with Mount Wachusett, you can see that for the academic year uh, 2010 and 2011, uh, their persistence uh, was at 42%. And for the 11-12 year, there was a significant jump up to 75%. Um, similarly, with Holyoke Community College, uh, academic year 2010 and 11, their persistence was around 44 percent. And for academic year 11 and 12, uh, that number, the persistence uh, measure has almost doubled. And for Pueblo, they've been hanging consistent with uh, the, the mid-60s to the, the low 70s. So that's, that's what we're looking at here. Um, first up is Deb Bebo from Mount Wachusett Community College. Uh, Deb, you want to say hi? Hi, I'm Deb, um, as the slide says, and thank you, everyone. Um, Prentice, uh, do you want me to uh, just go ahead and launch on in with the two different strategies that I had emailed you about then? Yeah, and so how this is going to go is just so the, the participants are able to follow. Uh, the questions will be up on the screen as a prompt, um, just uh, as a, a place marker so that uh, folks know we are the panelists and the participants as well and uh, that to sort of pace us. So without further ado, Deb, I'm wondering if you could share with us uh, strategies, practices, or tools that um, you use to motivate students to persist and or um, promote uh, high persistence rates. Thank you, Prentice. Um, so what I'm going to do is just kind of go along with a, a two-pronged um, description of this. And the first prong of it is as far as your strategies and practices, it's, it's a lot of um, 
lot of things that we've been doing uh, kind of all along and uh, tweaking over time. And what was particular um, during those, those uh, two particular academic years which were being compared um, we had the benefit of resource specialist uh, longevity. We didn't have a change in personnel, uh, so we had a longevity of relationships um, with the students and the caseloads, um, and not having a change in the resource specialist preceding and during those years um, highlighted, um, I think was a big contributor towards retaining the students. Um, another thing is at that time we had access to an in-house counselor who um, had extensive therapy skills. Uh, he was running a, a different program within our division, um, but he was he was like another arm of the um, college mental health counseling uh, services that we have here, except that he was uh, close by. He was highly visible with our students, and so he was able to provide that um, you know, a little bit of augmentation to the resource specialist uh, for any students that were struggling with any issues. Um, another thing that we ramped up between those two years was we um, really uh, plugged more of our students into a lot of our summer, uh, summer dual enrollment programs uh, through the Upward Bound Math and Science program, uh, through other dual enrollment programs where we're offering um, our, our community college classes at a nearby four-year institution, which is actually closer to where a lot of the uh, our students live. And so we were kind of able to ramp up that momentum towards students continuing to earn more credits uh, during the summer um, at low to no cost to the Gateway program. Um, and at the same time, you know, we're, we were able to um, help the other programs fill up the classes and fill up those seat slots with those extra dual enrollment courses. Um, the other thing that uh, was really ramped up during that time was the uh, what I call the sandwich semesters, where they're not in the first semester and they're not in the last semester. And when you're looking at fall to fall persistence, assuming that you know students need three or more semesters in the program to graduate, um, pr previous to that we had you know a, a tough time trying to keep students engaged during those sandwich semesters. And so what we implemented was um, you know, you've heard of the academic lab, but what, what we did is we um, turned it into a non-credit course with the college so that it actually reflects on their student schedules. There's an actual uh, uh, course number assigned to it. Um, students are, are enrolled in it. It is a non-credit course, but the high school does accept it as high school credit. Um, so it was a more formalized approach to um, really doing that, that check-in with students uh, when they're on the comprehensive campus. Um, so that was just a, a, a kind of a, another piece. Um, and I could really, you know, go on and on about kind of like the, the holistic support, but uh, one thing that I had mentioned to Prentice when he emailed me about this and, and he you know, highlighted the, the jump in the statistics, um, one thing that I will greatly attribute it to, and this is something that uh, hopefully will be valuable for directors is the is the with the database and the way things are reported and if you go into the gateway form on any student you'll see that there is a piece that um, it's under gateway tracking and where students you're able to track whether students successfully completed a foundation curriculum did they repeat the foundation curriculum at any time um, and, and what's more crucial is student is an exception, exclude from earned credentials calculations, and the exception reason. And you'll notice that if a student is an exception, um, you can click on yes if the exception reason is if they transferred to another educational program, they moved out of the, the school district, or if, they, if there was a medical condition or they aged out, uh, deceased, or if there's cultural factors. And those are you know, the options that are listed in the database. And one thing that, um, you know, being an older program, we've been with the older versions of the database, and sometimes you get just a little bit complacent with, all right, so this is the database, and you know, you see the updates, um, you know, that are coming with the database, and you're seeing some of the new features, but, um, you know, as, as an older director, sometimes I don't really key in on all of those new reporting features. 
And what happened um, about a year ago is um, when there was that question about exclude from earned credentials calculations. And I asked the question, does this mean that I can kind of be like a, a regular school district when a student transfers out uh, to somewhere else, that I can also report them as an exception if they've transferred to another alternative program? And the answer was yes. So <clears throat> what we did is we went back through all of our students who um, had left the program without a gateway diploma credential. And through an intensive, a very intensive push with all of the other alternative education providers, uh, through social media, through our adult basic education providers, um, we were able to um, track down the completion statistics on students who left Gateway without a, out of a diploma but earned a high school credential elsewhere. And once we updated that information in the database to exclude them as an exception, um, two major, two, two key data points in the student's outcome and summary re report, those was on page five, and it's that fall to fall persistence or first to second year retention. Um, that was, that across the board, across all years, that experienced a very large jump. And then the other piece, which is great for your reports for your presidents, is um, the graduation rate on page 11. That had a drastic uh, increase. And what I notice is whenever um, we're finding out updated information on students who have left the Gateway program without a credential, if we're able to track and verify what they're doing, we're able to update it in the database. Th these percentage points, they keep changing. And so, um, I would say, you know, there's the holistic piece, that's the one prong, and then the other prong is the, da the database piece. And so that's what um, was being, is being reported out, and that's, um, Prentice, you know, that's what you've seen as well. Um, so that's what I'm sharing with the, the directors, and I, I hope uh, it is useful. Um, and so, you know, one of the questions might, you know, that people would ask, well, are you verifying? what these students are doing, and the, and the answer is yes. And again, that is through other high schools, other alternative schools. Uh, sometimes even when you go online, you Google someone's name, um, and it turns out that they have graduated from a different or their previous high school. You didn't even know that they went back there. Um, National Student Clearinghouse has also been an option um, because if in the event a student enrolls at an institution um, as a matriculated student, that means that they have earned a diploma or GED elsewhere. Um, but I would say that our adult basic education network has probably been one of the um, largest relationships that we've been able to build, because at least in, in this region, the, the uh, GED track um, has been a very popular option. So um, that's pretty much the, uh, the scoop that I am able to share with you. Yeah, and Deb, that's that's uh, quite comprehensive. Um, there's a lot of things that you said in there that directors can latch on to. Um, and I mean, I, I appreciated everything that you shared. Um, with regard to the database exceptions, um, you know, you, I think you provided great detail for the folks on the line um, about uh, what it is that uh, you're talking about. And I, I think that this also could be an opportunity for directors to ensure that um, for the students who have exited the programs that their status is correctly attributed, um, meaning, you know, maybe there's some mechanism by which uh, the data liaison can go back in and, and double check for disenrolled in students and what their their status is so so that you know, if someone is being uh, coded in the database as disenrolled, uh, when in fact the reason why they disenrolled is one of the exceptions, um, that is an opportunity for uh, programs to uh, impact what their, their student outcomes look like. In addition to uh, the more involved piece that Deb mentioned, which is hey, for these students that you know that they've been transferred to another program, go find out what happened to them 
and then uh, with um, specific information about their disposition, um, you can then go back in and also change uh, their coding in the database. So lots of, lots of good information there. Um, Deb, the you mentioned, oh yes. Yeah. I was going to say, if I, if I could just add, add to that, as far as if a student is, is exiting the program, um, you, you know, the, the very beginnings of some type of exit plan, uh, if you're still able to have contact with the student um, prior to them disappearing completely, but having some type of exit plan um, helps to provide a clue uh, as far as their intentions so that when you're doing the follow-up later on this, um, if you're able to refer to their exit plan, that that has been helpful in in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned um, you know staffing, and I think staffing certainly is a huge consideration uh, with regard to student retention. Obviously, um, if you're running a skeleton crew, then everybody's essentially doing whatever they can um, to um, provide the level of student support that makes them uh, want to come back. Um, and Deb, you said, you said, um, so I'm thinking about roles and responsibilities, but I'm also thinking of this next question um, that really has to do with uh, making persistence happen. Uh, and this could also have to do with uh, resources. And you mentioned a, a number, or at least, uh, a couple of resources and approaches. One had to do with the in-house counselor to help with the caseload. Um, how can you say a little bit about how one goes about making that happen? That was just because uh, it was another um, staff person within our division running a, a different program. So w we have about 15 programs, including Gateway, that are part of a larger division. So it didn't cost us anything just because we were able to, to utilize resources that are already uh, available within the division. And that's, that's something that we, we do with all of our programs is we do a significant level of, of collaboration um, so that there is really no additional cost to it. Um, you know, we, we have you know, several of our Gateway students are, because of our school partnership, because it's a TRIO talent search school, um, the students are also able to participate in the TRIO Educational Talent Search Program uh, and some of the additional benefits from there with the, the campus visits and, and, and things like that. So and that's just uh, one example, but um, the director of our uh, innovation school was the one that had a lot of, uh, you know, had an extensive counseling background. Um, but that was during, you know, the, those two years that were highlighted, especially the year where you saw the jump. But, he has since moved on and uh, took over uh, an innovation school in a, in, a, in a school district, so he's no longer with the, the division. So those numbers might might go back down, and that was that. Um, but that's one of the key things that I can attribute to, you know, those two years. Um, but it didn't cost us anything. He was right. being paid out of the innovation school budget, and it was just another uh, another add-on um, as far as the the collaboration piece. Um, yeah. So, I mean, all, everything that I highlighted, there wasn't a cost to it. It was just more of, you know, how do we, um, you know, how do we implement well, the, in the academic lab? I mean, that's, that was an easy peasy thing. And um, the resource specialists are actually facilitating the academic lab. So that was no additional cost. And then the same thing with how we look at the data. It was just uh, looking at it in a different light. But, um, yeah. No additional cost there. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, um, I especially appreciate you uh, highlighting really sort of. Um, let's see, how could I put this? Um, you know, um, implementing structured changes um, essentially without a budget. <laughs> um, you're making good use of existing resources, and I've, uh, and especially that that really becomes important with programs, again, that have smaller staff. Um, and I just wanted to, to uh, underscore some of the things that you shared specifically for those programs who might be a little bit shorthanded. Uh, take, take heed uh, to some of these examples that uh, Deb has shared. Um, uh, 
everything from the summer dual enrollment to uh, the in-house counselor um, and those types of things. So, um, Deb, uh, if directors were interested um, in doing some of the things that you said, what, what might be a good first step? Um, if, if I was a new director, I would, I would call um, uh, another director just to kind of find out how. Um, yeah. And that's, I mean, I, I'd love to, you know, love to chat with anyone and just kind of uh, help uh, problem solve and, and troubleshoot. Um, yeah. But as far as, you know, a, a good first step is, yeah, I say look, look, look on, on, on your campus, um, you know, as far as the collaboration uh, piece, you know, maybe see what other similar types of programs are on your campus where you can uh, collaborate together as far as a cost savings uh, initiative. Um, but, you know, I think a, a, an easier first step is, is if you're implementing a very uh, formalized academic lab where it's an actual course with a, a code number assigned to it. And, you know, the big thing is it, it, it prints out on the, on the student's schedule and it, it makes it a little more formalized and, and students think they understand the picture more when it's instead of the resource specialist saying, hey, come and come and see me on such and such a right. day regularly, right. it's more of your, this is your class that you're going to be in. And that's where we've been able to do some really um, intensive uh, curriculum with connecting students to, to the campus and um, you know, really getting them ready for those next steps. But uh, I would say um, you know, talk to the, your institution's registrar uh, or, it, I mean, it's a non-credit course, so if your institution has a division of lifelong learning, workforce development, kind of the the um, the division that oversees a lot of the non-credit offerings like for the community or the you know the summer camp programs for for, for kids um, whoever oversees all of those non-credit courses um, that would probably be a, a first um, step yeah great advice thank you much welcome um, we're gonna go ahead and move on to uh, Vivian from Holyoke Community College hey Vivian Hello, Prentice. All right. So you ready to rock this? <laughs> Absolutely. Now, actually, I <laughs> thought I was going third. Do you want to go to Janelle first, or do you really want me to go next? Um, you will go next. OK. You ready? I sure am. So, so I'll right. just come, if you want to ask questions, or I'll just jump yeah. in. Yeah, and, and you know, just for the setup. Um, I'm wondering if you could share with us any strategies, practices, or tools that uh, you or your team uses to uh, promote strong persistence, whether it be motivating the students, whether it be doing some, some other structural things, as we heard uh, with Deb. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, in thinking about this, I think the one word that kept coming up for me over and over was infrastructure. Infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. We are... Um, before we got to that place, I'd say we're very good about knowing the kids, loving the kids, supporting the kids, believing in the kids, all those fabulous um, fuzzy pieces that I think are, yeah. are a profound part about what we do. But what we noticed was we could do all of that, but if we didn't have the scaffolding in place to give the kids options that, that, that um, met their learning style, that um, met them if they had to step out of something midterm, which is something else that they could step into. So we spent a lot of time building infrastructure. And there's um, four things I want to I want to highlight. The first is um, I'm going to call it generally flexible full-time schedules. So our kids have to be full-time in the same way that a college student would have to be full-time, with the equivalent of 12 college credit hours. But if we were to put our kids into 12 college credit hours they would crash and burn and die, and it would end poorly, right? Not for all yeah. of them, but for yeah. most of them. So right. we, offer, we customize schedules with a combination of college, developmental college classes, college-level college classes, high school classes, credit recovery at Gateway, credit recovery in the district, credit recovery at another alternative school here on the campus, night school in the district, summer school in the district, intercession classes, five-week classes, May master classes, and independent study. Wow. So it's a lot. <laughs> and so our best friend in this process 
is the person who um, on Deb was talking about the non-credit side of the house, and I agree with her completely. And we couldn't do our job without a really tight relationship with the person who's essentially the registrar of non-credit, because we have CRNs, we have dozens of CRNs every semester in addition, or the course registration numbers, in addition to what's offered on the credit side of the house. And, um, and we, it's the same thing. You have to have a room, you have to have a teacher, you have to have a contract. All of that is in place. And we need to make sure we have enough hours in those classes to meet what the districts have as a minimum for their students to get the credits that they need to get. But with all of that in place, we customize, we can be flexible with each kid. So that's the first piece. The other is, in terms of classes, is offering scaffolded, scaffolded classes in the areas where our students often fail. So our prime example of that is biology. We would have students coming in, they need to pass biology to get their diploma, but they probably have not been successful in a high school biology class. So to put them into a college biology, which essentially is the entry level course for students wanting to get into the nursing program who plan to do you know, anatomy and physiology, we had two students in three years actually successfully complete a college biology. So what we've learned to do is to hire a college biology teacher to teach a high school biology for our students. So she's coming at it from the perspective of here's what she wants all students coming into her college class to learn in high school. And that's what she's teaching. So it's kind of a developmental biology from that perspective. So our students are getting the high school piece along with a little bump that makes them more ready for the college biology once they get there. But that was us looking at our data and going, oh my god, no kid will ever pass our program because no one can pass biology. How else do we get that content, content to them successfully? And then the other piece um, is that we put students into regular college classes starting their first semester with us. We don't do foundation term the way it's traditionally understood, partly because we just don't understand how to teach college culture except having college culture role models for the students. So they'll, have, they'll routinely have some classes just with Gateway, but they'll have some classes where they're one of one, two, or three Gateway students in a regular college situation. And they generally do better in those classes, and they like those classes better, because I think they taste what college is in that situation more than when they're in with other Gateway students. So that was the first one, um, is kind of flexible, full-time schedules, customized schedules for students. Number two, and Deb was also speaking to this, our students take courses in all five terms. Let me explain, because we don't only really have five terms, but let's say students are starting in the fall. They take the regular 15-week fall semester. They take the two-week intercession, which is offered by the college. So this year, it's June 6th through June 17th. It's from 9 a.m. till 3 p.m. It's dark, it's cold, it's snowing. And you could do a three-credit college class in those two weeks. So we have some tried and true classes that our students do well in during that time, and they get a high school credit and college credit for them simultaneously. And by the by, for those of you who have state standardized testing, we offer biology during that time, and then the biology MCAS happens to be early February, so woohoo, it's a win all around. Um, then of course the spring semester, so we invented May semester, we actually stole it from somebody else in the, in the program, in um, Gateway where we do the same thing as intercession only in May. Our college doesn't yet do May master, but they allow us to, and we administer it under the summer um, headcount. But we do it during those lovely two weeks between when the community college ends and when the districts end. So if you have kids who are one credit shy of what they need to graduate in June, May master is the answer. And then, of course, summer term. So. The first one was customized flexible schedules. Number two was all five terms. Number three is credit recovery. I do not love this option. I am not proud of this option. This isn't why Gateway exists in the world. But I'm here to tell you that if a student steps out of a college class or even a high school class for whatever reason, if there's not something there to take its place, that feels like a reward to the student, or it can feel like a reward. Credit recovery says, OK, you stepped out of robotics. You still need a science credit come and do earth and space science on credit recovery, you'll still get the high school credit, and you owe us that time, because this is part of your of what we expect you to do. So um, we, we have a credit recovery coordinator, who is our loving fascist, 
coach who really keeps the kids on point, and they get a grade for that course. It's a real course for them. Then the last piece, this, this piece is a little bit of inspiration because I feel like all I've been so far is nuts and bolts, is middle skills and trying to figure out where we could use um, the students' high school electives in order to get them some sort of credential where they're able to make a decent buck and therefore be able to continue school. So a number of our students have gotten their CNA license through us. They've gotten their EMT certification. We have students in a culinary certificate program. Um, and so far, that's all we've done. I'd like to have more options. But the CNA has been a magic bullet because kids can finish that and then get a job making $12, $14 an hour being a CNA, and that enables them to continue their lives and support their families and continue in school. That's what I got, Prentice. Yeah, that's, once again, that's a lot. I hope uh, folks on the line are taking lots of notes. Um, very substantive um, approaches um, this morning. So um, the five semesters, um, just a, just a touch about what it takes to get those structures in place. The fall and the spring are are obvious, so that's that one's yeah. really easy. Um, one of our, a beautiful thing that's happened for us is we have difficulty getting labs for our students to do things like a, a high school biology because the labs are used, you know, from eight in the morning to nine at night all the time. But during an interest session or a main master or a summer, those high usage physical spaces aren't used as much. So that's what we're able to do. Like we use, we have a course called patient care skills, which is a science credit where the students learn kind of basic health knowledge combined with biology. And so we, our students get to use the $40,000 computers that look like people that give birth and pee and blink and respirate and all that sort of stuff. And so our students wouldn't be able to get anywhere near a resource like that during the regular school year. But during May semester and intercession in summer, they can. So um, part of it is figuring out where are you up against the wall in terms of being able to enroll a student or use the resources that you want to use, and how are those more the times that are more downtimes for the rest of campus? You could take up more space during that time. So for us, you know, we have to establish, we have to get the CRNs, we have to find the instructors, we have to contract with the instructors, we have to make sure there's the bus doesn't run to campus in the same way. So we have to buy a bus to bring our students to and from. We need to make sure that those infrastructure pieces are put, are in place. But we have had we have almost a 90% um, completion rate for students in those um, bizarre little semesters that we offer. Mm, that's awesome. That's awesome. And I think, like you mentioned, it goes back to that flexibility. Um, you know, one size fits all obviously doesn't work for our students. And um, that brings me to the point about credit recovery. Yes, I agree with you. It's not the greatest. Um, you know, it doesn't scream. Uh, college readiness, but I think as a strategy, as you described it, to sort of keep students engaged with education, uh, sometimes credit recovery might be that saving grace to allow a student to have a measure of success, and then they can come back uh, and begin to take a fuller course load with, with a little bit more confidence. So um, definitely loving that, loving the, the middle skills that, that you, you uh, uh, you mentioned so um, good good stuff um, how does how does the rest of your staff come together to support these uh, approaches that you mentioned um, we kind of we all do the envisioning together looking at the data pieces looking at what students pass what they don't pass Jada who's our resource specialist is especially instrumental in this because she's looking ahead what do we need next semester, the semester after that, the semester after that? So she oftentimes will isolate the need, and then I'll use my connections at the college to figure out how might we meet this need, who's the best teacher, how do we do this? Um, and then Julie is the person, her office is in where the students are, and so she's listening to them. So it's one thing to look at data in terms of what classes the, the kids pass, but it's another to kind of pay attention to how they're talking about things, how they're right. talking about that experience, and so we kind of bring that qualitative and quantitative pieces together. And um, so the, the three of us are all working on that. And then we have really strong relationships with the academic deans on the credit side of the house and the registrar and the non-credit side of the house. So when we need to tweak things, 
they're very gener they're very kind to us in letting us tweak tweak things as we need to. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you you have that flexibility with um, sounds like some key contacts there on campus, which allows you to structure flexible um, educational engagements for students. Exactly, and and I try to make sure, I want the campus to understand that Gateway, the success of Gateway helps our college be successful because we, we are providing, we're a revenue stream, we're a student stream, many students of color who are moving on and being successful, many of the things that are important to us as a college, Gateway is a living embodiment of, and so I want the rest of the campus to feel the same kind of investment in us. And so um, kind of we, we rub a lot of elbows, a lot of shoulders, we do a lot of, you know, cooing, and um, in the hopes that that kind of is a healthy reciprocal relationship. Yeah. You know, um, Vivian, you, earlier you mentioned um, it, it sounded like a, a great expenditure of, of resources, but I know that um, you've probably been very frugal, and, and again, relationships help with um, not taking on too many expenses, but one of the things you mentioned, the hiring of a, um, a college biology teacher to teach the high school version, um, so that was one thing that stood out that might have a cost associated with, but in general, I'm wondering if you could speak to uh, the cost element of uh, the approaches that you mentioned. Um, we Pay, we pay full tuition for our students in college classes, and so that's a big chunk of money every year. The other, but for high school level classes, we hire the instructor rather than having the students pay tuition. So that's that's cheaper for us because if we have 20 students in with that teacher, we're paying that teacher three thousand dollars ish, and you know we're getting 20 credits out of that or so. We have a credit recovery coordinator who works 18 and a half hours a week and for the 43 weeks of the term. And that's a huge expense and worth every penny because essentially she's teaching history and science and math and English and art and all of that um, in one classroom and managing all of that. We also um, we have a learning coach. Uh, we got money through the Vision Project here in Massachusetts to hire a learning coach. And that person's also 18 and a half hours a week and is an English tutor, a math tutor, and a general kind of organizing help and um, so that's an additional cost to us. The, the, the buses and the, the food when um, the other schools aren't in session, we do get Title I money um, because we're one of the Springfield Public Schools. So we use that money to bus and feed the students at the times when our schedule is different than the, co than the college schedule. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and Again, uh, you shared a wealth of knowledge, but for directors who are just dipping their toe and looking at this question about persistence, what are, what are some good first steps? I'd say pay attention to your questions. If you're saying, I, you know, I've run out of options for the student, if you have the time to sit with your staff and say, if we had other, what other options do we need? If if you know if there's if I had a magic wand, what other options do I need? And then pull together the team of friendly people on your campus to see if you can get develop other options. And again, using building an infrastructure which is in addition to the college infrastructure in order to build options for your students. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you were very specific about saying infrastructures in addition to your college's infrastructure. Uh, maybe say a little bit about why the distinction, the necessary distinction. Well, the when I say college, I'm really talking about the credit side of the house. And for sure. me, that's already, that's, that's the easy piece for me. You know, there's sociology and English and whatever, whatever, and we sign students up for those classes. And that's a system that's, that runs without a hiccup. Mm -hmm. And but then there's all there's the high school classes, there's the hybrid classes, there's the main master classes, and all of that. And so um, it, the infrastructure for that is a figuring out what you need, and then again, it, I suppose what it is is making sure that everything's real. One of the things that scared me when I first took this job was there was stuff where there was just little scraps of paper in a file, but it didn't exist anyplace else but kind of the director's desk. 
I want to make sure that if I step out of this job tomorrow, that if my students are in a high school biology or a high school geometry course, that there is legit an instructor of records. There's a classroom. There's a time. There's a CRN. There's midterm grades. There's final grades. That there's the same kind of a, same kind of accountability for everything that's in addition to the credit college classes, yeah. so that I can so any district can ask me at any point, and I and I'm not making anything up. They essentially MSU make stuff up, right? There's no MSU. And the same with the credit recovery. Our students can only do credit recovery when they're with the credit recovery coordinator, because otherwise they can cheat quite easily. And I feel so strongly that any district who asks me, how do you know this student actually did this geometry course? I know because the student was doing it in front of Diane for three hours a day, three days a week. And I know that because we didn't allow them to do it other places where their big brother might be able to do it for them. So I, essentially, I want us to be legitimate, and I want us to have bones that are so strong that no one can question what we're doing. That's right. And, you know, the, the bigger message that I wanted to bring out is that um, relying on existing uh, structures alone without uh, creating uh, structures that are customized to your needs, um, you can't expect that to just happen, and you can't expect um, students to get the best support and services that they need purely relying on just currently what exists. I think what I'm hearing is there's a need to create some additional structures on top of what already exists. Exactly. All right. All right. So um, looks like we're about 12 minutes out. This is this is real meaty stuff, real meaty stuff. Um, Janelle, are you with us? I am. I was taking all, right. all the notes. <laughs> oh, even you, huh? Uh-huh. Awesome. Awesome. So that means uh, we got some real strong information. So, Janelle, I'm wondering if you can share with uh, the participants on the line this morning um, some of the strategies, practices uh, that you use to motivate students to persist and or strategies that your, your team takes on um, to um, enhance the uh, okay. level of persistence at your program. A couple of the things. Um is, is what Vivian had mentioned. We do have a Maymester. I don't know if, if we stole it from somebody else or if we were the, I don't know how that came about, but that's an awesome um, engagement tool to we, get um, motivated. My first, my first uh, awareness of it, I think, was when we had uh, the San Antonio College awesome. uh, who, who adopted a number of strategies that we're talking about here who had a similar okay. approach. But anyway, back so, to you. Um, we did we do that, um, but two of the the main ones that I wanted to focus on was um, we do go real real heavy for foundation students and do a boot camp preparation, and it's almost a week long before the semester actually begins. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to look at um, data to show that students that actually complete that have a higher chance of completing the foundation semester. There's always those outliers and something happened out of their control or something, you know, and they weren't able to complete the whole time or they didn't come or, you know, we make decisions with our heart and we go, okay, we'll let them continue. And predominantly those students that don't um, participate with that boot camp don't do as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, however, go ahead. Um, we want to throw out just a few topics of some things that are covered during that boot camp. So for foundation, it's really, there's a lot of icebreakers, so it's a lot of actual, um, what we really focus on is building relationships in the cohort. Um, however, there's a lot of practical stuff too, so it's how do you get onto the credit recovery program so that you know right from um, day one what's expected. What are your passwords for um, the college um, portal so that you know exactly how to get on? Um, so it's very practical stuff, mm -hmm. which you think don't take a long time. However, um, if you've ever had to <laughs> even teach a new employee to get onto all the systems, it can take a while. Mm -hmm. So um, we do all of those kinds of activities. Plus, we have a, um, a forum for, for the students to listen to from um, existing students of what to expect and and um, we have different speakers from the campus that come to present. And so it really gets them ready so that when semester begins, they're a lot more about aware of what takes place. What, what we've um, implemented, though, 
over the last couple of years is not just the foundation boot camp, but a transition and continuing boot camp. Sometimes we think, okay, those are, oh, we're good. They're, they finished foundation, they're good to go. Um, however, they start becoming disconnected. And so we um, have a couple days where they, well, actually one full day, where they come and they get their books and we go through the expectations again. We do a campus tour again. We um, actually participate with the campus and we're able to get them onto um, engaged in the campus uh, college tour and orientation. So it's a full day kind of activity where they're, they now feel like a college student. Um, and so we do a lot more with the transition and continuing than we used to. Um, the second strategy that we've implemented is an appeal process. So um, because of our population, we tend to have students that may be considered more riskier or have a lot more risk indicators. And so um, there are students that in any other kind of traditional school, they might be dropped. And what we do is we allow them to um, appeal to a committee, and it's with all the staff and part-time instructors, and say what would change because we understand that some habits need to take a while to, to get past, and it may not work in one semester. Um, and so we've had repeat foundation students, or we allow, if they're transition students um, going into the continuing semester, they might not have done as well. Something out of their control happened, or they were just young and made some bad choices. And so what we started doing is we wanted them to have consequences, um, but we wanted them to understand that we are here for them and we want to give them a chance to continue to learn how to um, um, work with those bad habits and, and change to a new script. And so what we've done is we make them pay back. So if they failed or were, were withdrawn from a three college credit class, we um, make them responsible for $100 of it, which is a lot. It's probably a quarter of what the cost is. And for a half a credit, we make them pay um, $25. Now, I'd like to say that we get a whole bunch of that money back, but we don't. Of course, a lot of our kids are very low income. So what we then instead do um, is we figure out, according to uh, minimum wage, how many hours they would owe. And they have to um, work in the office or help in the classroom or do some volunteer stuff on the campus to make up that time because we want them to understand that yes we're giving you a break and we have faith in you but you have to earn some of this too and so it's during those times that they really have been able to network with other people outside of us um, that have kept them on so those are some of the the strategies that we've implemented yeah. I like that I like that uh, the working on campus and in the office that's real unique um, how does the rest of your team also support um, or play roles in supporting uh, these strategies? I guess well, part of I guess being part of the the uh, the appeals committee that's one way. Mm -hmm. um, and the decision, you know, so so it's a, it's a democracy, and sometimes um, we take somebody that one person just is totally against, but we everybody is really good about okay, how can we figure out a plan for this particular student, mm -hmm. um, an alternative plan, or with an alternative person? Um, right. So they're really involved with that. With boot camp, everybody's involved with boot camp. So actually, my staff look forward to boot camp because it's something outside of the, the classroom, the lecture, the discipline, the calls. The, you know, it's fun and just having fun with our students and, and seeing them learn to um, interact appropriate. Right. You know, and I, I, I mean, every everything that I've heard this morning, um, lots of awesome ideas. Um, and the Transition Continuing Boot Camp, uh, another great idea. Um, you know, I, you know, I've heard from a lot of students, and they say a lot of the similar things about moving from foundation, which is this you know, analogous to a big warm hug, and then uh, moving to transition, which is uh, in some ways, uh, you know, uh, being out in the cold a little bit. And so that's that sounds like an awesome idea, and I'm sure that students get a lot out of it. Um, 
but with these approaches, uh, nothing happens for free. And so, you know, getting the campus, uh, select members on the campus involved, um, what are the, you know, and then, of course, with, with students who are dropping courses, that's a little bit of a cost. But uh, in terms of these strategies, are there any direct costs associated with uh, implementing either of these approaches? Not outside of what we're already paying, which what I would consider a sunk cost. You know, if they failed the class, we, we already paid for it. Sure. So, yeah. um, but I would say that there is an increased um, cost because now these students have, you know, it's more risky that we're enrolling them in college classes the next semester. Um, so we have to really be, um, we have to really explore different classes that they can find some success in because we don't have the flexibility to be, I loved that um, um, Vivian Vivian? talked about, yeah, all the flexible schedules and including all those, that we with our particular partnerships, it, it's college credits, um, it's foundation, which is the non-credit, and it's some approved credit recovery classes, that's it. And they have to be in so many classes, otherwise they're not considered a full-time student. And right. so um, we really have to kind of massage how we're able to still help them be successful in fitting into those full-time um, rules. Yep. Uh, as far as changes, though, um, if, if I could, I mean, there are some changes that we've already done, and, um, and that was the appeal process and just really um, trying to be more quantitative and objective and less subjective because we tend to really, you know, of course we're all in these fields because we love the student and want them to be That's successful. Right. That's right. So we really try to work on each other to stay focused on, on the quantitative. Um, right. Okay. Um, I'm going to move us ahead. You know, we're a couple minutes out from the top of the hour um, and just put this question to you. Is there any additional information that you'd like to share with our uh, participants that hasn't already been discussed? And this is to um, either Deb, Vivian, um, or Janelle. No? Okay. Um, so uh, for our participants, um, I know that we are brushing up against time, but I at least wanted to provide a couple minutes um, for your questions. And um, in order, why don't you go ahead and use the hand raise feature, and then I can unmute you. And while we're waiting for that, um, Janelle, Vivian, and Deb, would you be open to questions uh, about anything that you've shared with the panelists uh, this morning? So if they were to email you, say, hey, hey what about that one thing you mentioned? Um, Prentice, I would. Uh, this is Deb. I would love for people to email me. Um, unfortunately, I do have to sign off and um, go substitute teach in a class uh, that starts right. right now. So I've got to run down the hall. Okay, blame it on me. All right, it's been fun chatting with you all. Good luck. Hey, thank you, Deb, for the great information you shared. All right, take care. Bye bye. Yeah. And I'm totally open to emails, Prentice. This is Vivian. Okay. Cool. Me too. This is Janelle. Okay, and it looks like folks aren't raising their hand right now, um, and it's probably because they've been just given a, a big dose of a lot to think about. Uh, okay, so we'll, this will be our one and only question. It's from George, and George, you are on. Hi, uh, this is George Benet from uh, Gateway to College in, uh, in, at Camden County College in New Jersey, yes. and I have, a, uh, I have a question for Janelle. Uh, uh, you mentioned the boot camp for the foundation and transition students. Uh, we, we do that, and we find that's, that's very, very successful. Uh, during the, the course of the regular semester, is there any type of uh, mini-reinforcement that goes on? How, how do you handle that? Because I, I know uh, you said specifically from the things that are, are spelled out at boot camp for all students, but during the course of the regular year, you know, uh, is any type of reinforcement. So Janelle, how do you reinforce what's being uh, shared 
uh, evade at these boot camps throughout the semester? Well, there's not a formal reinforcement, but there are um, bi-weekly meetings that they attend. And um, every opportunity that we can engage our students in activities, even for the students that maybe um, they wouldn't consider being successful, we um, invite them to participate in certain things just so that we can kind of see their face and touch base outside of a meeting and outside of an orientation. So believe it or not, a lot of our kids just hang out right outside our office so we can find them pretty quickly and it's just, it's daily informal reinforcement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have one other question from Faith Grant and it's, for Janelle saying, would it be possible to get a list of items from Janelle's boot camp? Um, if you want, Janelle, you can send that to me, and then when I send out the, the uh, webinar recording, um, I can, you know, post it to Gateway Live with any other materials. Um, I have an agenda, so I can kind of take some dates out of it and, and send that for um, the foundation students. For the transition sure. students, it, it really does change based on what the college is providing. So we're not sure. as structured, but they don't know that. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. Whatever you feel comfortable providing, um, I'll make sure that gets out to the participants. Sounds good. Okay. Um, just want to uh, uh, wrap up a little bit with a couple of things. Um, and that is, um, the, again, that we'll post this uh, for the participants, expect a, a brief survey, four quick questions, uh, it's information that will help us improve these engagements. Um, and then the last thing is stay tuned for upcoming topics in the Sharing Success Campaign in 2014. Those topics will be focused on cultivating and strengthening stakeholder relationships. And the other is student summer engagement strategies. Uh, I think we heard a couple on this call. Um, so, um, any final thoughts, Vivian or Janelle? Um, no, the, the only thing that I would say is that it would be nice to um, get somebody from the college side invested in the program where they have a designated role, not necessarily every day, but to come in and just be connected in that way. So that's something we're actually working on now. but. If right from the beginning we could um, incorporate that in MOUs, I think that would really help with those transition and continuing students. So when we're, when we're transferring students on, it's a smoother transition and the college is more invested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, any final words of wisdom, Vivian? No, I'm all set, Prentice. You're all set. She shared plenty of uh, words of wisdom. So <laughs> that's thank right, you I'm all. After <laughs> So thank you all. Thanks to our panelists. Um, hope that you make it through this day, the day after uh, Thanksgiving holiday, and uh, wishing you um, hol uh, great holidays, of course, uh, in this month as well. And uh, take care. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.